sustainability panel is the last kind of aspect of this evening. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it's a little bit of an opportunity to kind of get to know what more groups are doing um, in the university. So, shall I start? I, I imagine you all know Nick by now. If you don't, this is Nick Bradford, our keynote speaker. Uh, this is Selena Walter, um, who is the kind of, would you say, well, founder or like, founder, well, founder of yeah. the Yummy Movement, yeah. which I'm sure you'll tell us a little bit more about in this. Yeah. Uh, this is Victor Yip, who's well, working on the NEST project, is that Sorry, yeah, yeah. fantastic? Uh, Joel, who of course is the head of sustainability um, at Warwick, and of course um, Anne Marie, who is, you are, you, you are the lead for, um, for professional and personal wellbeing at Warwick Medical School, please. Thank you very much all for joining me, um, and I hope you've been enjoying the event so far. So, just those of you who haven't spoken yet, um, can we start with you, Selena? Can you just tell us a little bit about the Yummy Movement and how people can get involved? Yeah, sure. So the Yummy Movement is um, it's a yoga. Cl uh, I'm a yoga teacher. One of my things is uh, teaching yoga. So the Yummy Movement is about integrating uh, life, art, expression, creative expression. So moving beyond yoga into sort of uh, creative expression, free free movement, and then at the same time combining that with an understanding of of, of food, of vegan, of um, of a vegan lifestyle, the sustainable lifestyle, and all the four or five different aspects of sustainability. They all come part of that to really create. Um, so quite in tune human beings, uh, in tune with themselves, in tune with the environment, in tune with the needs of the environment and starting to really consider um, taking a step back and so putting the needs of the environment above yours. So for example, I actually really like fish but I decided to stop eating fish. I mean I went vegan when I was 15 but I, just, like, I decided consciously that I was going to go against my own desires, personal desires, because I understood that there was a wider implication for my, for my actions. And then uh, the dance and the, 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 the yoga stuff came into that because um, the more you work with your breath, the more you are aware of your breath, the more you can feel yourself. The more you feel yourself, the more in tune you are with other people, with the environment, with your actions. And the huge value action gap that we have nowadays, I'm sure you are aware, uh, you see someone who's like, yeah, yeah, I totally care about the environment, and then they throw something on the ground. Or they're like, yeah, yeah this and that, and then they go shopping somewhere with you like, why are you buying? at L'Oreal or like when you're not thinking about it. So it's about complete mega awareness. I know it's really challenging and that's why the yoga helps and everything like that. So yeah, the Yummy Movement is about that. I have an Instagram, you can follow me. I post every day about the sort of simple lunches <coughs> that you can take. I know that that seems to be like one of the most challenging thing is prepping lunch for some reason, even though it's, it should be easy really. Oh, I don't know actually. Anyway, so I just say, so there's lots of stuff like that on Instagram. There's a website that you can check out. I teach every day i just came from class i teach like two three hours a day at work sport i have my own business i teach privately i have one-to-one -one private clients i teach personal training yoga classes and i also offer the whole food consulting um, aspect of it so it's all about integrating exercise and awareness of of your impact of the environment um, and yourself i think that's kind of it there was i gave you a really nice line but i forgot it but yeah if you check my website it's like Life art expression increases sustainability. Sustainability increases life art expression, something like that. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. And Victor, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. Um, so, as Alex said, I manage the NEST project at the University of Warwick. For those of you that don't know, the NEST is a sustainable construction project. We're looking to build a new teaching and study space. Um, it's a wholly student led project, and we champion three ideals sustainability, innovative learning, and student leadership. Um, the project started quite humbly as a shed and through student and staff collaboration it's sort of the ambition of the project has grown dramatically um, and to sort of get an idea of the scale of the project it's planned to be 300 square meters and cost about 1.2 million pounds it's going to be by WBS near WBS um, so yeah from those humble origins the NEST project aims to be a, a new beacon of sustainability at work, and that's the project I manage. Fantastic. Um, and Anne Marie, can you tell us a little bit about Yeah, uh, so I work as a doctor, partly in the NHS and partly teaching medical students um, up at Jubit Hill campus, and that campus is a little bit further away from the main um, excitement down here. Uh, so I really wanted to do something to kind of build a life up there, and um, so we are creating a, a herb corner to 
uh, bring the edible campus up to the Jupiter Hill campus so that as people walk by they can uh, call herbs and maybe it'll give them ideas for what to cook for their dinner or um, we're hoping to maybe teach people how to take cuttings as well so they can bring herb plants home. Um, one of our students is uh, going to set up a, a second allotment up there because our students have such a full timetable that they don't get down to uh, societies on main campus unfortunately. Um, we also had a, a well-being day up at Gibbet Hill yesterday uh, where we had a big uh, seed giveaway and we just got um, a lot of the seed packets if you, if you buy them, they cost about two quid and they usually have much, uh, many more seeds than you need actually for a typical garden so what we did was break down a lot of those packets that people donated uh, into smaller packets so that to give them to way more people um, and we're also trying to uh, take cuttings and make new plants to then give out to uh, students so that they can have student, or plants in their rooms as they're studying and, and there's a lot of research evidence coming now from within health that uh, patients who have access to a window where they can see out um, to trees and nature uh, use less analgesia when in hospital, get out of hospital quicker um, so there's, there's good research evidence now uh, linking exposure to nature and, and well-being so we're trying to uh, bring a bit of that to our medical school and to the university generally. Great. So um, something that you mentioned, Selena, just then was that even though people are increasingly saying they do care about sustainability and do care about the environment, there's there's almost a disparity between that and those that do take actions which kind of align with what people are saying. I mean, of course it's incredibly difficult to live a fully sustainable life and there are obviously some people that it's easier for to do so. Uh, what would what do you think would make people make that step a little bit more and actually engage with the sustainable lifestyle if they already have these ideals? I mean, do any of you have any? Well, from a from a sustainability sort of champion, like I, I did the green steps training that. Um, um, yeah, like, was with National Yeah, that was like three years ago. So. Anyway, so they taught us there, and it was like you need to tap into something that the people care about. So if there's something that you have that you haven't tapped in yet. That's your kind of thing. So if it's about the animal ethics, if it's about your own health, some people go it's more sustainable because they start thinking, oh, actually, we need to be healthy. <coughs> Other people go politics. There's super mega reasons, political reasons, why you should be sustainable and vegan and everything like that. So if there's something that you can find, that's personally how I see it. And I have five reasons, so they're all equally strong. But I would say that going with a, a seed of some kind would definitely help. I'm sure other people can contribute. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. Um, the best way to spread sustainability at University of Warwick is to have really effective advocates for sustainability and to be an effective advocate, as you said. It's all about tailoring an argument for a person so you can convince anyone in the street that sustainability is actually what they deeply care about. You want to build on their sort of key ideals and say, look, you already care about this. Sustainability is linked to this. It's logical that you should care about sustainability too. I mean, a really easy reason to be sustainable is your finances. So as a student, you don't have a lot of money. So if you start wasting half of your cans and whatever you cook and whatever, you should think more about your food, right? Because you don't want to waste half of it if that's like all the money that you've got and then you can't go out or whatever else you guys do. So money is a really big reason. And, and, and higher up, when you go and you're like pushing for, for stuff to happen, money is one of the biggest drivers for any organization to get on behind sustainability because technically, most of them, I don't think, care about the environment, but they care about the money more. But that's a good way in, so. One of the things, sorry, that, that I've experienced here is that um, I, I thought it might be quite a battle to get patches of ground around the university, and I had such a positive experience. The states were kind of like, oh yeah, sounds like a good idea. And we're just kind of thinking, all they wanted to do really was to look at the ground before we stuck shovels into it to make sure we weren't going to bust through a gas pipe or something. So they were incredibly supportive and were more thinking about how they could help us rather than uh, putting any obstacles in the way. So it seems like this is a place where if you've got a bit of energy, it sounds like so many of you are doing fantastic stuff already from the presentations, that it's actually quite an easy place to get things done. Um, if you have an idea. Yeah. The, I think the interesting thing for me, and it's the second time I hear that, you said that you know, if people say greenery, they heal better. Mm. And, and for me, connecting to what you were saying, it, it, it sounds posh or a bit frivolous to say that. The, the, the well-being aspect, I mean, well-being is so much in the news that it becomes not very nice to say, but the, the fact of feeling good 
I think is, is important, it's equally important, and anybody can see that in different ways. Uh, and I don't know if it's scientifically explained why people eat better if they see trees through the window, uh, but it's, it's, for me, it is about this, so you may feel equally good if you had a good meal of simple ingredients because they were really tasty and juicy or whatever. And so that, that for me, is sustainability because if you don't feel you have to go to an expensive whatever processed food to feel okay and you can be equally satisfied with a salad of avocado or whatever, it's probably <coughs> twice as cheap and uh, probably twice as good for you. That's, that's my view of linking well-being and sustainability and we probably don't do enough of that. Thinking of it when we discuss building design with my colleagues, we certainly think about making sure there is enough daylight going through the window, but I don't think anybody talked about how much greenery you can see through the window, so that's an interesting point. I mean, next you encounter this in your line of work as well. I imagine you do find some people who are a bit resistant or say they care. You have too much greenery. Too much greenery. I mean, I, I don't, yeah, I find that I, I, I never meet anybody who thinks that saving planet for the want of a better expression is a bad thing. I mean, I think what's been said is absolutely true. And I think, uh, but what fascinates me actually is that, is that we, today we live in a world where we are richer, we are healthier, we live longer, we are better educated and we are safer than we have ever been at any time in human history. So, but then there is a disconnect with that and the fact that rates of depression, mental illness, and all sorts of um, um, uh, slightly more complex problems in some ways are, are, are on the rise, and yet those things haven't got better, even though we are richer, happier, healthier, and more safer. And I, my personal opinion, I, and I know that there is some good evidence that to come out there, is because fundamentally we are more disconnected from the natural world than we have ever been. And um, what, what I can certainly say is that uh, you know, a pygmy who lives a nomadic life in the forest up until 10 years ago had never seen money, had never you know, seen any kind of real human, um, uh, any of the human world that we exist in fully, or some of us exist in fully, isn't, might only live to 60 um, and doesn't have any of the things which we would consider to be normal, but is incredibly happy. Uh, and, and, and that's actually shown quite clearly, actually, that you know, these kind of simple lives actually do lead to, to, to higher levels of happiness. So I think there's a, I think there's kind of a big conversation that we have to have, and a big movement that we need to um, to, to start, which moves towards more connection with the natural world. Interestingly, in Europe, I think that that is now, I think that's really gathering speed. I think there's a huge way to go um, because we do have echo chambers. You know, we 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 all probably speak to people who agree with us and and then we don't realise that there's you know forty eight percent of America who went to vote for Trump. And you know, were those people, you know, did, did they would they share these beliefs or not? I'm not sure. So but you know the rewilding movement that's going on, that's really that's really exciting. There's an increasing um, awareness that we need wild places in, in our you know, in our societies and our countries. So I think there's a I think there's a, a movement that we're on. I think it's moving in the right direction. But I, I, I'm afraid that I think that there will also need to be some fairly basic uh, legislation that just needs to happen. You know, I mean, they just need to ban these. It's, it would be so simple. Just, no, right, in two years' time, it's illegal to sell plastic bottles. In two years' time, it's illegal to sell single-use disposable plastics. Of any kind. And I mean, it would be the simplest thing that the government, and it would be clear, decisive action the government would take. All of the companies would innovate. They have cornstarch or reusable bottles or whatever. And so I think that we are going to get a long way down this road through the things that have been said in the last five minutes. But I'm, I fear that there will just have to be some pretty basic like, wake up from, from, from government, actually, in, in order to get us all the way down. No, I'd certainly agree with that. I mean, the kind of top-down approach to kind of limiting people's scope of action and trying to innovate to create um, a more sustainable kind of style of life is definitely going to be important. But obviously, what all of us are involved in is kind of, it's, it's preempting that. It's trying to do something before it gets to that stage. And if you look around campus, we are fortunate in the kind of, um, the environment that we are surrounded by. It's incredibly beautiful. There's a huge amount of green space at the moment. 
Um, and when you look at things like the energy trail, students can get involved in, in kind of getting more attached to nature. But of course, there are challenges. We, we are all here essentially to either do some research or study or, or, or support the university infrastructure. And so there is that sort of disconnect that between our purpose for being here and necessarily our enjoyment of that. So I just wanted to ask each of you, in kind of, in kind of trying to promote your projects and, and further them, what is some of the most difficult challenges that you face? Is it the fact that people aren't necessarily engaged with sustainability while they're focused on other things at university, or is it something else? Um, I'd like to talk about a challenge that I expected to have working with the university quite closely and actually turned out to be just not a challenge at all. And I guess before I started working on the NEST project, I had a preconception of the relationship that students have with staff. And wrongly, I thought that at its core, it was, there was an adversarial aspect to it, that students that want to do something at the university have to go against the grain and against the university and their governance structures um, to you know, put a building down at the university. That's what I thought a big challenge would be. But it's actually come to pass that staff like John, who we work with very closely, are very keen to engage with students to make the university greener. And that there is, you know, a, an event like this, starting to run this year, is a great example of how there's such a massive appetite for students to become more sustainable. And here I see in the audience of staff and students that collaboration is, um, is great. And the level of collaboration, which I thought was going to be a challenge, turned out to be not a challenge at all. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We didn't rehearse, but no. <laughs> it's, it's very good. Reality check is that it's only like 40 of us here at the room, yeah. so it's not, it's not 30,000. Uh, however, I think there is a, there is a gener general sense that the university as a whole, and I never say, like saying the university, because at the end of the day, it's people. But I think the governance structure of the university do understand that something has to happen. That's probably why, although we may be like you know, scratching the corners and uh, being disturbing, they, they let it happen because people probably accept the fact that something needs to happen and it's okay that somebody tries. Now, it, it becomes difficult sometimes, and you, you see how much time it takes, because it's, it's somewhere sometime about changing established processes, and it's not necessarily easy. The same as, you know, if we have to forego plastic bottles tomorrow, it's possible, but some people will be thinking, oh, I'm losing out here, so I don't let it go. So it, it's, it's constantly changing the balance between people <coughs> who accept and people who are reluctant. But I think I, I do agree, it, it's moving, so yeah. Similar to how Nick was talking about the way people live in the Congo, for instance, is starting to change. We don't want them to get their protein and their livelihood mm -hmm. from hunting animals and people sort of having them up, uh, you know, the, like the, the beehive scheme. Those sort of changing those set paradigms that we, uh, those paradigms that people exist in, I think, is a great challenge, but a challenge that is being overcome. Taking people from where, where they are to where they maybe they need to be, or, or, or we have a vision for where they, they sh should be, because of course these things are all subjective, um, uh, not subjective so much as I mean, based on evidence and so on, but we have an opinion. This room is about, about a sustainable future, of course, but people have people who sit on the board of oil companies and plastics companies have different opinions as to what the future might look like. But um, that's always the hardest thing, is to, is, to, is to persuade people why they need to change. And um, that happens through advocacy, like it's been said, and it happens both through that, and as I said, I think it needs to happen through stronger <coughs> leadership. It needs to be both ground up and top down, in, in, in my opinion. But I think if you can, certainly I can say from my experience at the first, if you can work collaboratively with your governing bodies, then that is, uh, you should make as much progress pushing on that open door as you can, because that is a, that's a really good thing to hear. I just wanted to add uh, that you mentioned that um, our nature is greed and selfishness, but this is not true. This is the framework that we currently use uh, on global economic level. And I just wanted to ask, how many economic students are here, or like from business school? Anyone? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. This this is the hope. Um, because economic school and business school they're quite local, nationally and um, internationally, but 
many economics and business students that I know, they just give me a smirk when I talk about sustainability and um, environmental changes that are going on. And the current model that we have now, um, I'm, I'm uh, doing PhD in behavioral science, and I'm interested in how we uh, use social information and personal decision making. So for me, it's quite striking that these people are just so ignorant to what is going on. Um, and apparently, the um, like framework that they use is um, money is the most important thing, the growth is the most important, and uh, not the sustainability. So how can we tackle? Um, how can we make this paradigm shift in? Um, this, well, in every one of us, to understand that probably money and uh, success, um, really expensive cars and so on. Yeah, it probably, you're doing really... Um, Realistic. Yes, so looking from um, what you're buying for lunch um, up to what is going on in Congo rivers, it's quite cognitively expensive work to do. I had this period in my life when I was so confused. I'm just like, I was looking at my sandwich and it's like, oh my god, <laughs> there's so much work in there. And like, what does it actually cost? I can't see it all. And this realization probably won't happen to many people. And how, but how well, it, but we actually have to push people to realize this. Um, and I want to ask you all how we can make it more faster. <laughs> I, I think I have an answer to your question. You talk about pushing for a paradigm shift, and that's quite sort of yeah adversarial. I, what we talked about in terms of tailoring responses, if there are, I hate to make a generalisation, but if there are WBS students and economic students that really only care about money, as you claim, then well, what, what? This is what they taught. I think the point is that you, you, the students are in a particular framework. There's a structure. It's the same in medicine. There's Western medicine, but there's traditional medicine. There's very ancient medicine. It's it's devalued. There's a particular thing that we are being pushed into. We are driven into this. It starts when you're in school. You're uniform. You're this. You're this. You work towards employability. There's never really a moment when people are asked, "How do you feel? What do you want from your life? Do you know about the?" Um, Bedingungs causes und Grundeinkommen. How do you say this in English? Um, free income, whatever it's called, like one thousand plant. Universal basic. Income. Yeah, the oh, universal basic income. income. That's a different attitude. Like, there's so many different things that are technically possible, but if there's no solidarity, like, and solidarity, I mean, like across the entire humanity, which is hard, is hard, really, really hard. But if you see that guy over there, he's not doing something. Well, why should I do something? And if that attitude keeps coming, mm -hmm. and that's why we need more people to just stand up for what they believe in, whatever it is. Like, if you just compost, that's amazing. If you compost and you're vegan, that's amazing. You need to push and stand up and be an example. And that's the only way I, th I think that you can keep pushing forward. Because, yes, you need legislation, but the amount that the government is in the pocket of these organizations, what is really going to happen? So if you get people power, people power, we have so much consumer power. If you stop buying plastic, you could go to Tesco, and I know you can get the broccoli without the plastic, but if you want to make a statement, bloody leave the, the plastic there. Tell Tesco, I don't want that. I want you to buy this, because in the end, Tesco just cares about money. So you tell Tesco what you want, and they will do it. But what I'm saying is there is that, and there is this growth model, yes, and you, on the other side, you have economic people who are saying, stop growth, stop growth, stop growth. But if, I think that is like really high up, yeah, you need, that is definitely sort of legislation, politics, I think that they need to decide or, I don't actually know how else, unless loads of enterprises come up and have a new, have a new model, because you can have flat lines, you can have different economic systems, you can have Bitcoin and all these other things. So if that becomes more popular, but again, what is in the, what's going on with people is that they're so constrained. Oh, I need to pay my rent. I need to pay my mortgage. Oh my God, my children. Oh my God, this. Like you've got all these fears constantly within you that push you to do something that you might not want to be doing, right? So if you take a step back and ask yourself, what do I want from my life? Come to my yoga class, but ask yourself, what do I want from my life? 
They can be for free. I've been teaching yoga for free. I don't care. All I want is that you guys experience yourselves and you have an opportunity to really discover what it is. And the other thing is asking about your lifestyle. Like, making these lifestyle changes. Some people, I, I, for example, never thought about owning a house. Only now do I think, oh, maybe I should own a house because that would make sense. But, do you know, like, people grow as well. So you can shape people's opinions and thoughts over the years. I think I drifted off. I lost my thought. But, um, <laughs> um, I can't remember. But it has to happen on a, like, really massive level. Yeah. Doing it individually won't help. Therefore, I'm, I'm, looking for ways like on a more maybe political level. I'm not, I'm just, in, well, started to be really involved in this like a couple of months, but um, it seems that it's really urgent and people don't realize where we're going. And the statistics for 2017 is kind of scary. Um, I have a couple of examples if you want, oh, yeah. <laughs> which, which are positive in a way. The, you, you may have seen that uh, suddenly a few months ago, I think the World Bank, will stop funding uh, fossil fuel projects next year, or the year after. Yeah. And Norway, who lives on fossil fuel and gas, mm -hmm. well, is going to <laughs> stop doing the same next year as well. I, I think, in some cases, people do that because they, this is no future in fossil fuel, so if they want to keep their money for the next 50 years, they need to, to change. But I think it's, it's a delicate mix, which is always moving between people power, and certainly mm -hmm. adhere to what you say, and companies reacting to people perception or to the perception of people's power and say, mm, perhaps I need to do something if I want to exist. Mm. You know, people like, you know, big company like Unilever or L'Oreal or whatever, they would have to make a change to uh, perhaps starting with the packaging, but then after with, with the product itself. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's moving slowly, but it's mm. moving. Yeah, it's moving slowly. And I mean, these things are connected. Like we've talked about two different solutions, you know, big solutions, <coughs> people power solutions. And of course, companies will respond if we all shout loud enough, they will do it. Yeah. Governments will do the same. Because, you know, co companies respond to pounds on their bottom line and, and governments respond to votes in the ballot box. And so there's a cut there is a currency with both lives where we can, if we all act, um, um, uh, yeah, change change things. I, I, your question was how can we make it move faster? Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's a really good question. Because that, that's the fear that we all feel, right? It's like, this isn't fast, this isn't fast enough. We're going to drown in a sea of plastic. The, the, you know, the earth's going to boil and there's going to be no animals left and we're going to have nothing to eat and all the bees are going to die and the flower, you know, all this kind of scary stuff. And it is scary. But I would, the one, maybe just one perspective that I would share is that you, you guys are all familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, yeah? Anybody not? Just basically the basic concept that every human being has certain needs and the most basic are at the bottom of the pyramid and as they get more luxurious. luxurious or esoteric, they kind of move up the pyramid. So right at the bottom, it's like food, and then it's shelter, and then it's warmth, and, then it, and so on, until it moves to the pinnacle of the pyramid, which is self-actualization, which is what's yeah. being at the yoga class. Um, so, but if you don't have one of those layers below, then there's no point talking to somebody who is struggling to pay their mortgage about, um, you know, self-actualization and how saving the planet is a really wonderful thing even if you don't have enough money for it. Mm. So I think part of the answer is we need to kind of have s the right solutions for the right people. Mm. And there are some, some areas where it's right to, to, to advocate people power and throw all of our weight behind that. And there are some areas where we just have to restructure our society, however that has to happen, whether it's through the people who are higher up the pyramid shaping society. I mean, universal basic income is a great example. You know, that would, I mean, and the way they're doing that in Finland, for example, they're seeing, you know, incredible rates of economic growth and, and um, much better standards of living. And I mean, it was just, you know, ranked the happiest country in the world um, yesterday. Um, so, I don't know, there's no, there's no one answer is my answer to your question, which is a real compound, <laughs> isn't it? A, it's a typical <laughs> panel answer of the question. But, but I, think you're, I think you're absolutely right. That yeah. You said it here for like, leadership in politics so important and what I'd be thinking is you need to go into politics. <laughs> yeah, do it. Yeah, do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Throw over the degree. Everything yeah. they say about politics is true. <laughs> <laughs> and it comes right from the former parliament. I, 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 I've been there. <laughs> to have a, to, well, my wife always said to me, because um, they say have, you have to have a thick skin, and she always said you have to have a strong heart. Which I thought was kind of sweet and 
I like that. I think that's what we need more of in politics. People are strong minds. It's something, it's true. It's something that we, I don't know if you have any other subject. We, we haven't talked about uh, uh, the uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We did in October, uh, we haven't today. Uh, and I think the, the, if you're not familiar, those 17 goals which are adopted, not necessarily implemented very quickly, I agree, but, but definitely uh, established and slowly gets <coughs> uh, implemented. It, it's, it's all about changing the society. It's all about identifying and making very visible the brilliant blocks. And I think the first one is zero poverty, yeah. or, or, or zero no hunger. Yeah. So it, it's not all about energy. I think energy and water is probably two or three of the 17. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it, 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 it's really addressing the needs of people before trying to obtain results. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, uh, one, one of the tasks we've put to ourselves with, with David is to try to, to identify what we do about those 17 here and how much we do. Um, but Again, you know, those 17, there's quite a wide spread of interest between people who are feeling more uh, sympathetic to speaking to people or some more technicians or whatever. But there's plenty to do for, for everybody uh, to try to make small changes. So um, I, I think it's, it's, it's a worthy uh, thing to look at. I think that's been quite a lot of the theme throughout today, that everyone can make a very small difference in whatever way you want to do it. And there are a whole host of ways to get involved. Um, and of course, as Joel was saying, uh, the, the sustainability department runs various internship projects and um, are always looking for people to kind of suggest new ideas on things we can do. Um, I'm afraid we've run out of time, so we won't be able to take any more questions. But just a quick thank you so much for all of you on the panel for joining me. Um, it's, I, I hope you've learned a few things. And if you're going to stick around, I imagine anyone that's got any further questions can probably ask them over a drink and some pizza. Uh, so can we just give a very much? Yeah, we'll thank you the same way, Alex, for organising the event we did. Yeah.